Hello, everyone. We are live here uh, in Cabo San Lucas for episode number two of Riffs with Rob, hosted by Craig. I'm your host, Craig McGrother, and I'm with Rob Beardsley. Very good. Uh, so this is episode two. Uh, what we want to discuss today, well, actually, I think you want to get your cigar sorted. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, why don't you set the stage? I mean, this is episode two. Uh, we're in Cabo. Yes, we're in Cabo for Hunter Thompson's Capital Collective, um, which is a group within a group, which is Raise Masters. Shout out Hunter. Uh, episode two here. Uh, you didn't bring me a cigar? I didn't bring you a cigar. What's that? You didn't bring me a cigar? Oh, well, you brought yourself a cigar, I believe. I did. Yeah, yeah. And you have a little better of a deck. What we're puffing on right now, I actually lit this before, but I'll relight it. It's an Oliva, Connecticut. But uh, before we get into that, uh, and you also have Oliva, Connecticut. Before we get into that, we are here with Capital Collective. So Hunter Thompson is the founder of uh, Raise Masters, and within that is another group uh, called Capital Collective, which is kind of the more prestige level of it. Um, and yeah, so here we are. Yeah, this is the big retreat in Cabo that we're excited to be a part of. And <clears throat> Craig spoke there yesterday. How was it uh, speaking on that panel? I think you did a, a great job and people seem to really like what you had to say. I'm glad I didn't sound like a com complete fool. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, it was uh, it was cool. It was um, definitely a nice little entry because I you know, do have some reservations and I guess limiting beliefs, perhaps you could say fears regarding speaking publicly. Uh, I am not an introvert by any means. I love talking, connecting, but something about getting on stage and speaking. I have uh, not an irrational fear, if you will, but I'm a little maybe uncomfortable, you could say, regarding that. So it was a good way to get my feet wet. Feet wet. Very cool. Yeah, no, it definitely was. Panel is definitely a good way to go as well, rather than trying to take the stage all on your own. I think I'd prefer to do a panel. I think it's more conversational. Um, maybe at some point uh, I could overcome that and make it happen. but. You know, seeing what you do, where you do basically just a 20 minute, 30 minutes, just straight bars and, you know, nonstop monologue, basically you just doing it yourself. It's um, starting to make content and starting to get in that world. Seeing you do that, my level of appreciation for those who can come up on a stage and just rip it and speak for that amount of time, uh, it's, it's really impressive. And I, I think people see it and you just assume that, well, well, that's what everyone does on stage, but Right. You or know, it's rehearsed or yeah, it's, you've got a script. Try it yourself, believe me. It is not easy. You know, you get up there and then the lights get bright, as they say. Can you pass me one of those cushions, please? I would love to. Thank you very much. Yeah, so definitely happy I got my feet wet in that regard. Um, and hopefully more things to follow, for sure. So why don't you uh, kick off the, the show? Yeah, so what I want to speak on today is something that's really important. Um, it's something that I've actually really been interested in. It's really appealing and why I joined the firm was just generally what separates us as a business in a very competitive market. So what I mean by that is, you know, we're in the multifamily real estate syndication space. We're not the only shop in town buying apartments. Unfortunately, it'd be really nice if we had a uh, moat around our business and we we're the only people doing it. But uh, why are we you know, good. Why do we have a competitive advantage as opposed to other people? Why would why do people invest with us as opposed to other groups? So sure. the floor is yours. Sure. So first of all, as you mentioned, we are in a crowded space and whether we choose to acknowledge it or like it, we are in a commodity business because like you said, there's a lot of people doing what we're doing and it can all look very similar, right? Hunter yesterday, for example, said, hey, we're all solving for 16 IRR. So <laughs> how are you differentiating yourself with a 16 IRR? I mean, and frankly, too, obviously everyone's inputs are a little bit different, but basically everyone's deal for the most part looks the same. So it's kind of funny in that sense. If every deal kind of looks the same, how do you distinguish yourself, right? Right. So the first ways that I'd say not to would be number one, which is to be cheaper on pricing which in our business are fees and your waterfall, right? Because in a commodity business, if you're trying to com compete on price, that's just a race to the bottom. And that's not where you want to be with your business. It's not in a long-term sustaining moat. Number two <clears throat> is projections. And we could, we could try to differentiate ourselves by saying, well, we're projecting 18, 20, 25% returns, right? And trying to compete on that is a losing battle as well, obviously, because you're going to eventually run into the issue of over-promising and under-delivering, and that's also not a sustainable business model. So just to get those out of the way, those are the two ways not to differentiate ourselves in the business. So to answer your question, how we actually do differentiate ourselves, it's in two main ways. Firstly is transparency, transparency in our communication, reporting, and then also focus, 
and then focus as it relates to our acquisitions process as well as our operations. Right, so before we unpack that more on the two reasons as to why, I want to first go into um, the fee structure. So what are our fees and what would be someone that would be, I guess, undermining and undercutting fees? What, what does that look like? What are the tale of two cities there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our, our fee structure is pretty industry standard. We have a 2% acquisition fee. We have a 2% asset management fee based on revenue. And then our waterfall is an 8% preferred return, which is cumulative and compounding, which is actually more attractive than what most people offer. And then we have a 30% promote up to a 15% IRR and a 50% promote thereafter. And so can you explain the cumulative and compounding, the 8% preferred return? Does that mean we get 8% cash flow on every deal? Yeah, so a preferred return is just simply a partnership mechanism whereby investors are owed a minimum return prior to us as the manager of the investment to make any performance compensation. So some deals, which I highly recommend avoiding, don't have a preferred return, and which means that every dollar that the investment makes is split with the sponsor or the investment manager. And that is not very competitive and not attractive to investors because in a downside scenario, those deals underperform, right? But in a downside scenario where there is a preferred return, the investors are put first in a priority to where they are owed that minimum return before we make any money. Gotcha, very good. And so you said our returns, or sorry, our fee structure is standard, which is 2% acquisition fee, 2% uh, property management fee. 2% so asset, management, asset fee. Ma management fee, excuse me, and a 3% property management fee. What does undercutting the market mean and look like? Well, you don't really see too many people do that actually. I mean, and also I would say more so people charge higher fees than what we charge. So, but I mean, certainly you could come onto the scene and charge a 1% acquisition fee and 1% asset management fee and try to be cheaper. The reality is you're not going to attract investors through a discounted fee structure. An expensive fee structure may preclude someone from investing with you, but a cheap one is not going to attract them enough to turn them from a no to a yes. So speaking of which, you have to know your audience, right? So when we work with institutional investors who are investing 90% of the equity or providing $10 million plus of equity, there's a different expectation, right? As you know, the fee structure changes, the waterfall changes. It's because we know what our audience is looking for and we understand that the terms are different. So like when we do, when we do do deals, what do people typically negotiate, you know, or is it a, der or is a common kind of ask, would you say? So in a syndication style deal where we're the sponsor and we might have a hundred investors, right? The structure is set by us, and then we present the PPM and present the offering, and it's basically take it or leave it. Maybe there's some negotiation, hey, if I invest half a million, can I get a better this or that? That's perfectly fine, right, as you know. We yeah, and we may say yes, we may say no. Typically it's no, I mean, obviously money speaks. If someone's gonna give you know, a handsome seven-figure check, then you know, our, our ears, ears are a little bit more uh, interested, if you will, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, however, in a JV situation where there's an equity partner that's com coming up with you know, the majority of the equity, then it's flipped the other way. The equity provider is the one dictating terms a as kind of the starting point. So and then it's up to the sponsor and the equity partner to negotiate to a, a JV agreement. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, you know, a, a structure set forth by the sponsor and then take it or leave it. Gotcha, so that's how on that and that's how our fees and, and what work. Let's go back to the two focuses you said as to how we stand out. So it's uh, reporting and transparency, is that correct? Transparency and focus. Okay, focus, gotcha. Do you want to get into those two and unpack them? Yep. So first focusing on transparency. As you know, transparency is involved in everything that we do. And it's really important to give investors that comfort and confidence in making that investment with us, but also feeling good about the deal along the way, right? Uh, so to unpack that, that's really two separate topics as well, right? Before the deal is closed, we're transparent in our projections, in, in what the pitch deck says. We provide our underwriting, we provide a full data room with all the due diligence. So we're very transparent in the upfront due diligence because we want to underpromise and overdeliver, and also we want to create as little friction as possible for investors to make the decision to invest with us. Gotcha, okay. Would you like to expand on that at all? Well, moving on to the actual portfolio side of things, once the deal is closed, transparency is also 
super important, right? Yeah, because we work so hard to, you know, get the deal done, and then the work really starts after that. Yeah. Totally. So transparency, uh, the way that we do that on the portfolio side of things is we have monthly emails that go out to the investors in, in each deal talking about key metrics, uh, any pertinent updates uh, for the deal, and we also, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. We also uh, have a you know, monthly distributions, monthly emails, and we also provide the monthly financials. And that financial package that we send out on a monthly basis is our full accounting package with general ledger, bank statements, P&Ls, rent rolls, uh, and, a, and a bunch more. So it's everything and more than what people really care to look at, but it, at least they know it's there and that provides them that comfort that we're being transparent, right? So that's on a monthly basis. And then finally, on a quarterly basis, my favorite part about our reporting is our benchmarking the actual performance of the property to the acquisition underwriting, right? That is so critical because we're telling investors, here's our projections that we actually pitched the deal on based on. And this is the, the car facts, if you will. Yeah. And then now, here's how we're performing every single quarter benchmarked against that. And of course, as you know, nothing is perfect. Every deal has challenges and encounters problems. So the best thing we can do is not hide from those problems, not obfuscate the numbers, but instead show them in plain English and show the numbers and say, here's what we projected, here's what actually happened. If we were off, here's why we were off, and here's our game plan to go and remedy and get back on track. Right, and you know, I think it's really important to do that because real estate business is the problem business. You know, there's gonna be issues that come up, whether it be you know, maybe unknown CapEx expenditures that come up that maybe aren't found in the due diligence problem or process. Maybe there's you know, a weather event, you know, we're in Houston and Dallas, there's freezes, there's hail, there's kind of random things that theoretically could occur. And it's just gonna happen. We're not the only people that will go down in that. We're, it's not as if we're the only people that are there and that you know, these problems are exclusive to us, if you will, but being transparent, you know, reporting what's going on, conveying the story, and um, being really upfront about it as opposed to hiding it is best practice. And that's you know, one thing that really drew me to Lone Star and why I invested six figures prior to working in the firm. I wanted to put my money where my mouth is because I knew I was tr transitioning into that direction. Uh, but I felt comfortable knowing the depth of reporting, you know, going through the webinar that, that we do. Uh, and I think these deals were closed, so it was post fun clo closing. But going through that, feeling comfortable that, okay, you know, some deals work better than others, but I do know that it's not there for lack of effort, that there's, you know, great treatment on my, my capital in that sense. Yep. That's super important, and that, that transparency, communication, reporting goes a long way. So that's the transparency element. Uh, the next part I mentioned was focus. And I think this is, the focus is super important because you don't get as many benefits, you know, if you are all over the place. You know, I think if I was a capital allocator, if I was a capital raiser, if I was a family office, I would certainly want to have not all my eggs just in one basket. That is extremely risky. Uh, you know, the rules, regulations could change. You just don't know what market all of a sudden is going to get crazy alpha. You don't want market all of a sudden is going to moon and, you know, absolutely take off. Uh, but from a sponsor, you want to be very niche, 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 and focus on a couple of places. So with that said, get into how we are focused. Yeah, so on the focus side of things, it benefits our acquisitions process and our operations. So on the acquisition side, we're benefited by being local experts because it helps us build better relationships with the local brokers, with the owners, and we can actually get better deal flow because we're a known player in the market and we can understand that deal flow better because we've looked at the deal next door, we own nearby, we just understand the market better. And so that access and insight leads to overall better opportunity. And I can think of two deals that really come to mind. Number one is one that we're in contract, so we're not going to name names on, but that property is legitimately bordering our property there in Houston. And then another property is Madison at Bear Creek, which is just next door to Timberwalk. So we knew that the seller had owned that property for about two decades. He hadn't uh, increased rents nearly enough to uh, what market standards were. So, and he had original units. So that coupled together was a, a perfect combination for us to really get a great value-add pro, uh, value-add business plan in there, implement it uh, with a really high level of certainty that we were able to pull that off. So, you know, we ideally want, you know, economies of scale in that regard and to have 
situations where we can buy properties as close as possible because you know we know based upon what our product looks like roughly what we can get as opposed to if we went to let's say san antonio or austin or arkansas well what are we compa comparing against H how do we know exactly what that looks like right All right how do we know the nuances of the market it's it's just so tough so yeah. that focus is really helpful how many properties just out of curiosity would you say are really close? I mean, I know Meritage is a little further away, which is a property we're looking at, you know, getting closed up here. And we got two properties in that three property portfolio that literally border each other, which is great. But, you know, would you say most of our properties are kind of bundled in the same vicinities? I think moving forward, that'll probably likely happen just due to us being, or basically just leveling up and, you know, doubling up kind of our portfolio. But would you say that's kind of more of a focus or? Well, we have a couple clusters. We have a few coastal properties in Houston. We have a, more deals kind of west and northwest Houston, which is, are fantastic areas that we like a lot. So, yeah, I mean, we're at the end of the day, it's all pretty geographically concentrated, which is the other element of focus, which is the operational side, right? And so, as you know, a couple years ago, we vertically integrated and we launched Radiance Living, which is our in-house property management platform. And... That wouldn't have been possible if we had deals in disparate markets in, like you said, Arkansas, Tampa, Denver, Phoenix, right? That just wouldn't work, right? So the way- As an investor, it will work, but for a sponsor, likely it will not until you get, I mean, what, th two, 3,000 units in an area, then you get the benefits, right? Yeah, something yeah. like that. So for us, the focus on the operation side allowed us to vertically integrate, allows us to have economies of scale, be efficient with our team and our management, and that has been a fantastic win for us and also just vertically integrating in general has been a fantastic win operationally as well as to attract more investors that appreciate uh, what we're building and, and you know certain investors especially savvy investors they want to drill into the management they want to understand what's the org chart look like what processes do you have in place what, like, what yeah what, why is the manager want to do it you know are they incentivized if they're vertically integrated and whatnot and we will for sure have, that will be its own episode without a doubt, why we're vertically integrated and you know maybe why we chose to do that earlier on in the process. So that is a probably an hour long podcast in itself about what that would look like on your end. And I know that story quite well, but that'll be a great kind of uh, story to share uh, on another time, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So transparency and focus are the ways that Lone Star Capital differentiates itself from its competitors. Gotcha, and there's any other note you want to put on focus that maybe you didn't speak on before we kind of wrap that up? No, I think I think we covered it, what do you think? Yeah, I just think, you know, on our end, um, distinguishing ourselves, uh, in other regards, having really savvy people uh, in the office and who we work with. You know, I said this on stage yesterday in the panel, but. You know, we, I don't think we have a link, wing, weak link in our firm. So I think everyone is incredibly efficient and solid uh, in our job. We're utilizing, you know, kind of an arbitrage employment play uh, with, you know, virtual assistants, which is helpful, not for, you know, the heavy duty task, but for some of the more admin S tasks, uh, which is awesome. So that's going to be a really nice level up for us. Um, and yeah, I, I think having a business plan in that regard uh, where, you know, where we're not trying to reinvent the wheel you know, we're, we're not looking for the, we're not, I think you said this, we're not uh, going to be digging the gold. We're going to be selling the picks and shovels. <laughs> so that's a funny uh, Rob Beards in line. Anything else you want to touch on as far as uh, this topic as to how we distinguish ourselves? No. Okay, cool. Well, we have something we also want to talk about, which is kind of funny, is, <laughs> is I think you know this. Is passive investing overrated or is passive income overrated? Passive investing not overrated, but is passive income overrated? Yeah, so it, it is kind of a funny thing because a lot of the pitch and marketing in the syndication space- Sells you on the dream, right? Yeah. Right, they, they sell you the picture of relaxing on the beach and getting to spend more time with your kids. I was wearing Cabo. <laughs> yeah. So the reality is, if you're a passive investor or if you're investing in the stock market and your pain point is that you're not getting yield from the stock market or you're, you're not enjoying the volatility of the market and you wanna move towards alternatives such as investing in private real estate, that's not all of a sudden gonna ra radically change your life and you're gonna be able to take a bunch of time off work and you're gonna be able to travel more and spend time with more with your kids. That's, 
uh, that first of all, that's just not true. And second of all, that doesn't resonate with me. And I also don't think and hope it doesn't resonate with our target investor. You know, our target investor, <laughs> we hope, is someone who is high net worth, ultra high net worth. If they want to take a vacation, they can take a vacation. Yeah, they, they work because they probably love to work, not because they need to work almost, if you will. Right. Um, or they have a big enough capital base to where they need to spend nearly full-time effort to allocate that capital, right. right? which is essentially what a family office's responsibilities or are. Or a private equity fund. Yeah. Right, a private equity firm as well. Obviously, they're just set up professionally full-time as a business to invest with sponsors like us. So that's more so our avatar, if you will, and, and our target investor. So it really just, I don't like it, and it makes me cringe a little bit when I see people pitching investors on lifestyle and you know, Get more time on the golf course, or golf more. Take take back control of your life and stuff yeah. like that. Because the reality so, well, is, well, let's actually preface this right now. You definitely can, but at let's just call it a five percent cash on cash return. All right, if you want a hundred thousand dollars coming in a year passive, we're talking about having two million dollars at you know five percent to make that happen, right? So if you have two million dollars, if you have four million dollars, the next thing you know, you have two hundred k coming in, which is a pretty incredible and structure the correct way, which would be in this, this might come through tax-free, you know, benefits, which is incredible. So yes, if you have that much money, if you have probably north of that mark, then yes, you can probably, you know, take back a lot more of your time. But for the, the typical, you know, investor who's investing $200,000, $100,000, maybe $50,000, it's a great way to start growing your wealth and compounding it, but it's not all of a sudden you do that and your life is, you know, rainbows and sunshine and you don't have to wake up and go to your job. So if you have the money, specifically two to four million, like you said, if you have that cash to invest, to generate that yield, to pay for some uh, enhanced lifestyle, that's great. But if, again, if you have $4 million, then that's not a problem for you. You already have a way to generate millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've already done the hard part. You're already an ultra or ease, ultra high net worth earner. You're probably making 500K plus a year, maybe at that point, depending upon how old you are. The easy part is making the money. The hard, I'm sorry. sorry For some hard, people. No, no, yeah. I'm sorry. The hard part is making the money. The easy part is allocating it and just picking the right investments, devising your portfolio across, you know, liquid assets, illiquid assets, and then specifically in art. So just to make a point, you know, we're not, as it relates to us attracting investors, we're not trying to compete with the stock market. That's not our competitor. We're not trying to go to investors and say, hey, you're currently investing in the stock market. It, Why don't you- it, no, no more S&P 500. Why yeah. don't you sell that and come over this way, right? We, yeah. we don't want those types of investors. We want investors that professionally or ex, are, are very experienced in investing in uh, alternative investments, private real estate like our, wow, geez. That's a big bug for those who uh, are listening. That's a bird. Yeah, he flew away, thankfully. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, so the reality is they, we want investors who are already familiar with the space, already want to allocate to private investments, and they want to find us as the right choice. Yeah. Right. So. So it's funny, and I think your, as they say, avatar, uh, which is not the movie, but is kind of more of your dream investor and kind of profile for kind of who we want to attract and have invest with us. I would say more of the, you know, everyday. You know, I, I come from the world of re real estate, so maybe you're looking at, you know, deploy 100 grand a year and, you know, you have that equity grow and whatnot. And then you're on the, hey, I'm, you know, running, you know, large pools of monies and I'm looking to deploy, you know, seven figures plus capital, you know, so. Yeah. Well, don't sell yourself short. Yeah. I mean, no, it's it's, and, not, yeah, like, it's yeah. not like you're incapable no, of, of course not. talking to right. big time investors right. and, and, and high Which level we've done investors. in, you know, Manhattan meetings, Midtown meetings, of course, we go in there and, you know, we have a good time in this, you know, in those settings and such. And it's not as if I'm, uh, you know, just sitting there saying nothing and I'm a mute, right? No. So yeah, my point in bringing that up right. is we as a company have established a strategy where your content may Correct. cater towards more of a retail investor yes, and, and yeah. I'll keep my content more focused on larger investors. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the firm wants to attract both. Yeah. It's a logical tandem. And both of us are capable of bringing you know those clients in and, and working with those investors right so yeah i thought that was an interesting point about the you know the whole passive income idea and the reality well, it's is just funny like you're selling someone the dream well if someone's already a millionaire their life's fine if you're you know 
not an accredited person, if you're, you know, under that a million dollar threshold for net worth and such, um, you know, it's not all of a sudden you're going to invest $50,000 and, you know, you're, you're on MTV Cribs next thing you know, showing off your house and, you know, you have gobs of extra time. You no, know, if, the you reality invest, is if, you, if you invest $100,000 with, with us, roughly, year one cash flow might be 4% or something like that and it could trickle up, you know, to year two, year three once the business plan is implemented up to six, seven, eight percent. Yeah, it's very realistic. That's what we shoot for, right? But, you know, then we're probably going to find the next investment because the business plan's been implemented depending upon where we're at and where the market's at. I guess bottom line is these types of returns are not life changing returns. Yeah. Right? You're not putting in a hundred grand. And it's a great a hedge against back. let me just say this right now and just preface this. It's the best hedge against inflation. It's the best way to make sure your money's not getting crippled by inflation. Uh, it's a very safe way to put it, and I like the fact that there's not just a constant stock ticker on my investment, and I also like the fact that it's a liquid. You know, I think mm -hmm. when stuff is too liquid, you start doing silly things with your money. You start, you know, trading into this. You know, you're looking at the next hot thing. Look at NFTs, okay? First, for instance, I think I saw somewhere that a notable, you know, influencer and whatnot, not to get into names, he bought something for like a couple million bucks, and then I think he sold it for fifty dollars or something like that in a two-year span. So it's just like, yeah, cool, great. I don't think a piece of real estate in, in Dallas, you, if you put 500K into it or, you know, a million dollars into it is going to turn into that unless you have, uh, you know, you raised MES debt on floating rate debt and, you know, got destroyed by the uh, floating rate debt market, right? But outside of that, it's uh, highly unlikely that a scenario like that would occur. Totally. So, I mean, I'm not trying to, <laughs> yeah. we're not trying to discount our returns or say that what we do is not. or undermine your goals of wanting to get financial freedom like heck we all want to do that but it's not as if unless you have as we said kind of probably north of five million dollars to invest that that lifestyle is just created all of a sudden and you know frankly i think another and this is just a personal tangent but if you don't like what your work looks like and you're really hating getting up to your job you should probably assess and you know create the life where you're happy to work because you know with how expensive things are these days and whatnot we're probably gonna have to work a couple more years longer than we thought we may have before, unless we really hit it big, you win the lottery for whatever reason, or you know you discover the next big thing, which is you know more of a anomaly situation than not. Yeah, so I think the moral of the story is for us to make sure that we're speaking to our audience and we know what they want to hear, right? Because right. that's just the point I'm trying to make. Our target investor, they're not worried about taking one extra vacation per year. Right? They're right. worried about capital preservation. They're worried about tax drag on their returns. They're yeah, worried about their 1031 exchange. Family legacy through. maybe even too, right? Like, hey, I, you know, maybe someone in their family, you know, or their family members put the real estate in a trust and the, they've 1031 exchanged it and this is their legacy, right? Which is kind of some of the family offices we may be working with, but stuff like that, right? Yeah, so as we're here at this mastermind talking about our business and thinking about how to grow and whatnot, this is a, a very valuable conversation to have and think about how, how to attract more of the investors that we want. Absolutely. Cool. Other topic now I want to get into is cigar talk. Um, so I love smoking cigars. I know you love smoking cigars. It seems as if, I don't know if social media has created cigars to be a bigger thing than what it is, or people just do it just because it looks cool on, on the gram, on Instagram and whatnot. Um, you know, maybe a certain uh, notable uh, rising star influencer, maybe the man of 2022 was big in cigars. I'm not gonna say his name. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, his initials are AT. Uh, but all of a sudden, everyone is smoking cigars now. But I think we've been smoking cigars now for over three years together since basically we kind of get, got connected. But you know, what are your favorite cigars? Why do you like smoking cigars? Kind of unpack your thought process and kind of the activity behind it, if you will. Yeah, my, uh, my favorite cigar brand is Oliva and we're smoking Oliva Connecticut's right now. And I also really like the Oliva Serie V Milano. That is a, uh, a very interesting, flavorful, flavorful, uh, it's, like a it's like a peppery, peppery, yeah, a little darker, more, I guess not bitter, but a peppery taste for sure. Yeah, so c cigars are, are a fun hobby. I think as we discussed last night, it's just a great way to relax, connect. It's, it's a very social activity, right. which forces you to hopefully slow down, get off your phone, have a conversation. And it's a great connector, right? You might meet someone for the first time, but if, if you both are smoking a cigar and have a mutual passion, it really is an instant connector. Right, right. And it's, um, 
great way to shoot the breeze, as you mentioned. It's a great way to kind of uh, slow down, maybe unpack your day, uh, unwind your day at the end of it. Do that. I also believe I saw a couple studies that have suggested that it increases your testosterone as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not sure why, but I have seen that study as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. So your favorite cigar is that. Do you have a least favorite cigar? <laughs> Or know. anything that you felt as if why why I just got I just got robbed by the pricing of this because I'm actually a kind of an advocate on this and it's just kind of like the wine theory right so you can get a great bottle of wine probably between twenty to fifty dollars but then of course there's wines that are three thousand dollars a bottle that are you know aged French wines or whatever or something of the tune of that right something that's older and maybe from a prestigious you know winemaker maybe it's you know from the Bordeaux region of France or you know, something like that, right? Maybe an aged, you know, Pinot, uh, something to that degree. But, you know, what is kind of the sweet spot for a cigar price range wise to you? And, and do you have any cigars you, you just don't like? Well, I think we roughly agree that around $10 is a sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, More than 20, it's like maybe some Davidoffs, right? Or Ashton's, I think can kind of get there. If you're, you know, get it, fortunate enough to be in a country or a spot where you can get a Cuban, incredible. Right, Cubans are definitely, worth the experience and worth the extra price as as you know you know I've you and I have had the pleasure of enjoying yeah but yeah for the most part you and I don't have such a refined palate that we can really taste the cigar I mean you and I don't really even retrohale no which yeah. is something uh, advanced cigar smokers do where they bring the smoke into their mouth and then up into their nose and out through their nose so right. they're not technically inhaling but they're retrohaling it to get more flavor because we have, I think it's like 20 flavor receptors in our nose and only eight in our mouth. So we do a lot of our tasting with our nose actually. So you and I just aren't there yet. So really just a, a lovely light Connecticut does the job amazingly. Yeah, that's funny. I have uh, something I have to say. There's Cohibas that are Dominican Republic Cohibas. It's like the blue the white and the red ones. And frankly, they are the most overpriced cigars in my opinion. It's like just a decent cigar, but why it's expensive is that because Cohibas were before Cuban and they obviously make Cuban Cohibas obviously, but they're not really sold in America widely unless you have a, a connection. There's people probably in Miami that can get them and whatnot, but they overprice them just on the branding and I would just never advise anyone to buy those. It's just, it's, it's just bad value in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's a lot of ways to overpay for cigars. Where, when, how old were you when you smoked your first cigar? So I actually received a gift from my best friend since I was four. On my 18th birthday, he gave me a cigar. And so uh, naturally we smoked a cigar that night. Did you like it your first time? Did you get a headache? Did you get like a stomach ache? Mm, I think I did like it. I think I was careful and I didn't inhale and didn't have a bad experience. And I think that was kind of the start. Uh, and from there, it was off to the races and uh, started, you know, enjoying cigars from there. That's awesome. Where's your favorite place to smoke a cigar? Hmm. And what's your favorite cigar setting, would you say? Cigar setting, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think Hot Tub is a great place to smoke a cigar. I'm not sure why. It's just a very natural fit. I know you... Uh, like a, a tropical environment. Right, right. Well, I just think there's something about being in a human, like this human environment, the cigar preserves nicely, just a nice setting. You know, it's a little hot out. You just feel good. You yeah, feel loose. this is a little hot and sweaty for me. It's a little, well, it's a little hot and sweaty to have this much clothing on. Yeah. Like a bathing suit by the pool, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Hmm, where else? I feel like, what are other creative spots? You know what's really, really cool? A cigar at dinner is, I was just yeah, say is a that. movie. That's a movie. So actually, we'll distinctly remember this. We were actually smoking Cohibas that were Cuban at Sea Satin in Mykonos, which was, I think we can both say, probably one of the best dinners we've ever had yeah. was uh, that, you know, I think like the, was it the risotto, ro lobster, lobster risotto, risotto. That was just out of control. I, I don't know how one can make it taste that good, but it was incredible. And for those of you who don't know, Sea Satin is basically Mykonos town probably my favorite restaurants literally right on the water if you're gonna go and go to Mykonos and you can afford it it's like I think 150 euros is what it comes with but it's like I want to say it's basically as much food and drink as you you could possibly need 
and you have an amazing time. It's one of those places that it starts as a restaurant. You probably want to get a reservation, you know, around 10 or 11 10 p.m. 10 o'clock, late uh, dinner. Yeah, turns around 12, into... yeah, 1230. Everyone start, is on the tables, you know, maybe a plate or two is breaking on your head. It's like exactly right. what you'd think it would be. In that right, regard. you're ending dinner, standing on top of the table, swinging yes. around a napkin. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, and, then, the, and yeah. then you parlay that into going into Scandinavian Disco, which is in the Mykonos town area and uh, the town is crawling and then, you know, that's probably about, call it 2 a.m. And then for those who like going in deeper in the night, that, the rest is for you to figure out, but. Yeah, not for us. Yeah. But yeah, the point. Well, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, but right. the point of that not story time, was, yeah, having a cigar at dinner, that is a really, really cool setting. And I think it's cool for us because you don't get to do that in America. It's right. very, very, yeah. very no, you, few places in America can you do that. Yeah, no, it's almost like a novelty, right? It's like you go to totally. Europe and, or even Asia, people are just smoking everywhere. And it's not like frowned upon, if you will, to have a cigar or something like that at dinner. Um, you know. You know what I don't like is some places in Europe I've experienced sit down at dinner, light up a cigar, and they say, "Oh, you can't smoke a cigar," but people can smoke cigarettes. It's sickening. Yeah. Sickening. Sickening. Foul. So, yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where in America have you smoked a cigar at dinner? Well, my backyard in Oregon and in Arizona. Fair enough. <laughs> to be honest. But outside of that, I really, I'm struggling to recall a place because people would just go get up in arms about it. You know, I also have a slight beef with cigars in this regard, is that the smell of a cigar smells so much better when you're not smoking it. Like if I smell someone else smoking a cigar, I get giddy and excited and I start craving one. But unfortunately, when you're on the golf course and you kind of smell from a hole or two over, I love, that, that is like, that is like my favorite smell. It's so amazing, but unfortunately, when you smoke it, you don't get the same smell. You get the the, the enjoyment of it, but it's like the, the I get the craving in that regard. But when you are playing golf and you get that, it's pretty sweet. Or just anywhere when you smell a cigar, I get excited. Yeah, no, it's definitely you exciting because you because you know at least in my head, I think, oh wow, there's someone enjoying themselves. Right, right. Someone's probably relaxed. Someone's probably having a good conversation. Maybe they close the deal, or maybe they're yeah. just you know can't be bothered. I love that energy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. What's your, now that we're in Cabo and this is probably the last episode we're gonna film here, what's your favorite vacation spot? Where is the favorite va vacation spot you've been to? I guess I'm gonna start this out of country and then domestically, where do you like go to, mo the go to most? I mean, internationally, I haven't really gone somewhere too many times more than once to really label that as my favorite consistent place I guess, to go. I guess your favorite experience to this point, because you're only, 26 yes he is 26 for those who are wondering um he's accomplished a lot for being a 26 year old uh but with that said you're 26 you've probably been to a couple places twice you've been to london obviously several times right but what are your favorite places to go yeah i mean i love london london okay. is my second favorite city in the world and behind new york yeah behind new york of course so i mean i'll just tell you recently uh my dad and i went to northern sweden to drive classic Porsches on a frozen lake. That was a amazing bucket list experience that we both just had such an awesome time and we want to go back. You know, I thought that- So you're gonna make it a routine. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Right. I, I, I figured it would be a one, in, one time life experience thing, right? You go out there, you drive on the, on the ice, you have fun, but then the novelty wears off. You would think, right? But no, it, it, was, it was amazing. We loved it and we're ready for more and we're ready to go back. Yeah. So. so are you basically saying to everyone listening that you don't need anyone to start a GoFundMe for your, you know, financial well being? <laughs> <laughs> my financial well being, my enjoyment. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, your pastimes. We're yeah. yeah, so we had a lot of fun there. Gotcha. So Sweden. What about any other spots? Well domestically I like Miami a lot. Okay. Do you think you'll ever get a place in Miami? Uh, you know, I do so much traveling as it is. Having a second base, having a, a second base, it'd be would, like a burden almost. It'd be a it, huge burden yeah. because I wouldn't be able to do it justice. I wouldn't be able to spend nearly enough time there. I don't even spend enough time as I'd like in New York. Right? Yeah. No. And you've heard it. me say this plenty of times, right? It's traveling so. No, actually, it, it, this sounds so funny, but I'm so excited for you for the fact that this summer you're going to get your bearings that much deeper in New York by not taking a month-long trip to Europe like we did together in 2021 and 2022, of course. So. It'll be really cool that you'll just be there to really, you know, entrench uh, and deepen your relationships with people there and, you know, kind of 
get more dialed up in the restaurant scene and you know some of the some I guess some of the nightlife scene as well, right? Yeah, and uh, let's let's do a shout out to uh, Ben Narison. Yeah, right, right. So uh, you, you want to explain? Yeah, I'll explain. So so Ben Narison is a former uh, partner at NEA, which is a big uh, venture capital firm, and he's he's a big name venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. Actually, he lives in Atherton, which is the town I grew up in, nearby where you grew up right. back in Silicon shout Valley. Shout out Menlo Park. Menlo Park. Yep. And so. Uh, Ben Narison is a, a great person to smoke a cigar with because uh, he never runs out of interesting things to talk about. And the notable thing about his cigar smoking is he will smoke it all the way down to an absolute nub to where it's burning his fingers. I think it was one of the first cigars you've beaten me on too. From well, this was a right? Robusto. Oh, and that, that was, yeah, so yeah, you, my, my, my you, speed is quicker. Right, you started with an extra inch, so I had mm. a little shorter of a cigar, but yes. Fair play. So I'm approaching Ben Narison status here because right. it's, you know, it's it's got some life left. But right, right, right. Very so. good. Awesome. Very cool. What's your least favorite vacation? What What is a place you went to, as funny as it sounds, and you immediately, I guess maybe not immediately, but you quickly realized that this was not for you? <laughs> well, going back to my dad and I's trip to Sweden, before we went to Sweden, we went to Iceland. And we went to Reykjavik in the winter time, and I've heard great things about Iceland and Reykjavik. I would both, love to both go for the winter. The, for, the, for the record, yeah. For the winter, maybe, maybe and it'll the sway me apart. I suppose, yeah. So, we. I, it was just not for me. There just was. I just wasn't interested in the. You are not a sightseer. Like you not were not. A a, you were not a sightseer. You're not. A, oh, we're going to see the nature. Oh, we're going to the museums. That's not really your, your yeah. bag. That yeah. that is not what I'm into. So my, I felt like such a loser because my dad and I are on this. <laughs> we're on this tour guide trip, and we're on this kind of bus essentially, and. The guy's talking about this thing happening here, and the, I actually here. couldn't imagine you being in a situation where you could be less pleased with what you're doing. I felt like I would. Was you just, rather underwrite someone another spon uh, another sponsor's deal than that? Yeah, that's tremendously interesting. <laughs> Fair enough. Looking at someone else's deal is very interesting. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that just you know, I don't think I don't think Iceland is a bad place. I mean, we went to the Blue Lagoon, which is a big draw for Iceland. Yeah, and that was very interesting, but also. Do I need to fly six hours to go and check out the Blue Lagoon, right? It's just a warm, it's a hot tub. I don't know. It just wasn't that. So, I, you know, I don't need all these interesting things with travel. I like to keep it simple. I like good restaurants. I like to go out. Well, you also have a phrase about travel, which I think you should maybe unpack. Yeah. Yeah. My big philosophy about travel is travel is about people, not places. Yeah. I'll go anywhere in the world if it's to meet the right people. When you are a very good friend, and I think I am as well in reference to, and all, all our, our group, our circle is really awesome about this. And I'm extremely grateful to have the friends that I have and the connections and such that you make a great effort. I feel as if I make a pretty solid effort um, to always get together. And that just go back to your, your people, not places. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you can go to the coolest place in the world. You can go to Khan and Mykonos if you're alone, it's gonna see satin. It's not gonna be fun, yeah. right? You can go to wherever, some no-name town, and stay in in America, and with with the right people, you'll have the greatest time. Or when we're talking about networking, right? Right. Networking is really expensive because is this mastermind expensive? This mastermind is very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And. If you if someone affords you the opportunity to, to meet and network with someone that might be very valuable to you, right? You need to jump on that plane. You need to go, inconvenience yeah. yourself, spend the money, and guess what? It might not work out. But those are the risks of networking, and I think it's an in, it's a it, life is not linear, and your networking experience is one of those things. You could by happenstance meet your next business partner, or your next venture or next investor by sitting on a plane or a ski lift next to them, right? Or you know, something random like that, or you just bump into them, perhaps smoking a cigar, or you could spend a ton of money to, you know, feel like you're getting rejected, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, is there any other place that you maybe have mentioned that you weren't the biggest fan of? No, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I think I have one in mind, but we won't, we won't dive into that. Yeah. I think my favorite place is domestically to go to is my family spot in Oregon. The price is right, all I have to do is basically buy a flight, and I'm on the Little Deschutes River and south of Bend, so I love that area. Grew up there going my whole life. 
Miami is really cool. New York's really fun because I get basically a, you know, five-star experience when I get out of the office and, and work in the corporate location and then I get to stay in Tribeca with you. It's, you know, really as sweet as it could possibly get. So those are probably my favorite two spots to hit is Oregon and New York. And then to, uh, internationally, I think Mykonos might be the coolest place. Mykonos and Croatia. I've only been to Croatia once. I would like to go back there. Uh, Mykonos is pretty incredible. So I agree. You know, yeah. yeah, it's good those stuff. Are the spots. Any wrap-up thoughts you want to get into? No, I uh, would just love to hear people's feedback, whether they liked our uh, digressions, diversions, uh, getting off topic. The segways. Segways, yeah. if they like you know, do they like the real estate stuff? Do they like the personal stuff? What more do they want to hear? Well, it doesn't no. really matter because we need to do both. But if you want to hear a little bit more, let us know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think just getting that feedback is, yeah. is interesting as, right. you know, this is a new thing. Obviously, you and I having a conversation is not a new thing. Yeah, this is what we'd be doing anyway. So I was like, why wouldn't we just record it? And Lone Star doesn't have a podcast yet. So I think a lot of podcasts as well have just real estate only. It's really in the weeds. And I think having the person who can get, I legitimately think the most technical speaker, one of the most technical people I've ever heard, thought leader is probably you, combined with kind of your philosophy, maybe some lifestyle incorporated is a really interesting approach and dynamic and, you know, hopefully, you know, people in the audience reacts accordingly and, you know, is a listener and, and you know, a longer, longer listener, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, and speaking to uh, about that, I think there's so many topics to go into that are still not just totally shooting the breeze, right? There's still valuable and actionable, such as morning routines, the gym, diet, Re relationships, relationships. How do you network? How do you sleep. even attack, how do you attack a real estate conference? Like we have right. so many thoughts on how to do that. And we've successfully raised millions of dollars from going to these events. So I think, you know, if we can help people along the way and whatnot, that'd be great. And then also if we can, you know, attract more investors that are like us who, you know, feel comfortable with us. Cause that's the biggest thing. Like us, feel comfortable. but maybe a few years older and a couple more zeros in the bank account. Right. Maybe a right. lot more zeros. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that will all be fine. But also, you know, if you're just starting to get in the investment world, you know, we want to have loyal people who, you know, start and end with us as far as investments. And we want to be the first person you think of when it thinks of, hey, I got to deploy some capital. That's what I would personally love. So that is awesome to me. Uh, so hopefully we can attract that. How can people find you? Well, also one more idea I want to mention because you, because you said that Lone Star doesn't have a podcast until now, right? We're now, yes, we're yes. now finally doing this. Risk with Rob, hosted by Craig. Please actually five-star review and then subscribe if you can. Yeah. It'd be great. So this is your baby now. You're making this yes. happen. As you know, I've been on many podcasts as a guest. And I even did, during COVID, launch my own podcast. But because it was an interview-based podcast, it just was very difficult. I can't imagine going. having to sort, doing everything you were doing, which is basically doing my job and underwriting and doing the asset management and creating and then thinking about mentally, oh, we'll I have to do, I you know, invite source, this person. yeah, coordinate times, go back and forth. That sounds Think like a nightmare. Think of questions. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that didn't last. I ran out of guests and I just gave up on it. So with this, I think you and I can, I can just ask you the questions. Yeah. I can ask you the questions. I'll think of the things if people want to give us advice or, you know, topics they want us to hit on, please feel free yeah. to do so. And we will be bringing on some special guests uh, from time to time as well, which I think will be a, a great addition. So going back to the fact that we don't have a podcast, I just want to talk about marketing a little bit uh, because it didn't happen overnight, but over years, we've now developed a pretty robust marketing infrastructure yeah. for the business. Right? And we're, it's funny, we're at this mass run right now where the biggest, probably the biggest focal point and the biggest touch point is actually marketing. How do you attract people? How do you create lead magnets? Just kind of technical in the weed, business cultivation stuff. Right. I mean, we all know how to run our businesses. We all know how to invest the capital. We're all looking for ways to supercharge our businesses by 10xing the amount of capital. And that even raising. as Hunter Thompson said, speed, right? If you make a million dollars in a year, that's impressive. If you make a million dollars over 10 years, that's not as impressive, right? Right. So speed is the X factor. Just going over our marketing infrastructure, we have top of funnel where we post on social media and we kind of attract people to us for the first time. They get to know us. Then a little bit further down the funnel, maybe they sign up for our newsletter. I've been sending a monthly newsletter out for four years now. And how big is our subscriber list? Because I think over, it's something to, something to brag about. Yeah, we have over 10,000 uh, right. email subscribers and we have over a 50% open rate. So uh, we have a you know an awesome growing base. And beyond that, we have case studies, we have eBooks, we have actual books, which I think are a big 
rock in your marketing infrastructure? You know, a lot of people reach out to me and ask, well, you know, what am I missing? What's kind of that thing that really supercharged your growth? And I would totally point to the first book and now the second book, which is just bringing more and more people into our network. What are the names of these books, by the way? So the first book is called The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. Where, they, where can they find that? You can find that at underwritingmultifamily.com. And? And then more recently, I published, or I should say we published because obviously I had a ton I of did, help. I did everything. Yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I didn't. The new book is called for the Structuring record. and Raising Debt and Equity for Real Estate. Right. And you can find that at structuringandraising.com. If uh, those URLs are a bit too complicated, you can just head to our website, lscre.com. And if you're dyslexic like me, uh, you can get it also on Audible, which is amazing. I absorb a lot more by listening. I'm an avid podcast person, so I think something like this is, you know, how can I create something that I would actually want to listen to? So I think we're doing this here where we have a real estate nugget, we have maybe a lifestyle nugget, and just a personal, you know, so, piece. Speaking of Audible, I was having a conversation the other day with somebody who uh, just wrote a book and they were asking me whether they should... Care to name drop? Uh, no, because I, I don't remember yeah. who it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, and they asked me, should I outsource the narration of the, of the audiobook or should I do it myself? And I, I mean, my, my answer is very straightforward. Why would you not take advantage of the opportunity of your voice speaking to the listener uh, of your content, right? If it's your... If it's your book, it's your content, it's your brand, why wouldn't you not want to be plugged in with your voice into the listener's head? So yeah, you get that much more comfortable with you. And you're, you're a very solid reader. You know, if I'm reading out loud, frankly, you know, I'm not, I'm not, that's probably not my strong suit. Okay. So, you know. So, yeah. So, thankfully, I did record uh, the audio books, which was actually a really fun experience doing that. I found, found an editor and a, a producer online. I just recorded it in my guest room with my mic and knocked it out. Uh, each one took me about a Sunday. Super fun experience. Very cool, very cool. How can they get a hold of us? How can they get on our distribution and newsletter list? You know, how can they see active deals uh, in our pipeline and kind of be a part of us and follow us? Maybe someone's just not ready yet. Maybe someone has to kind of listen and get a hold or, and, and absorb us for over a year like some of our investors, right? How can they uh, get into our process? Yeah, so to learn more about what we have going on at Lone Star Capital, uh, head over to our website, lscre.com. And do you have any information there, like uh, any guides, any eBooks? We have our passive investor guide available for download. That's just a quick eBook. Uh, you can also fill out our investor form. Uh, when you know filling out that form will provide, will put you on our investor. And in, jeez, put uh, put you on our investment distribution list. So you'll see our investment opportunities. Also, it will prompt Craig to give you a call and. He should call you right away as you fill out that form, so be prepared. And if he doesn't do that, then you need to reach out to me so that I can scold him about his uh, <laughs> right. My tardiness. poor work ethic. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So how you know? And then if you have any questions about any of our deals, you can also also always send me an email. My email is c r a i g craig at l s c r e dot com. Perfect. Let's end it there. Absolutely. As always, pleasure, and uh, hope to see you and uh, have you on and listen to our next episode.